What's happening, everyone? Friedemann Findeisen here from Holistic Songwriting. And yes, it's almost Christmas. Hence, I'm saying my name right just this once. Um, today in our artist series, where we look at the biggest artists in the world and what we can learn from them, we are looking at Agent Fresco's Dark Water. Check it out. <laughs> So we are in a really lucky position today because we don't just have the final master of the song, but we actually have the stems, which were kindly provided by the band themselves. And we also have an interview, which I got to do with um, with uh, Toti and Arnor, which was really, really great. And we're going to intersperse that throughout this video. The song Dark Water, I love this song. I'm a huge fan of it. I think it's so, so smartly written. At first glance, this looks like a really simple song. And it is. Underlying everything is a very simple structure. As you can see here, uh, just look at the bass track down here. We can see that the intro, this section here, is kind of what forms the basis for the choruses here at the end. So let me just zoom out a little bit here. These are all the choruses, these three here. And then this first one here is the intro, which again, forms the musical background to what later becomes the chorus. Um, we have verses here in between, and here we have a bridge or a C part, as the band themselves call it. And if you look at what the Moog is playing in the verse, you can already kind of see that it is very similar to what the bass plays in the chorus. So essentially, even though it doesn't really sound like it, we have one whole pattern that forms the entire song. And this is something I advise people to do all the time. I'm a huge fan of doing something like this, where you have one central idea, and then you explode that out into a song. And it works so beautifully here. And I think the main reason that it works so well is because this core idea is fairly complex and the whole song never feels boring now, I should also say that the verse and the chorus don't have exactly the same chords. There's quite a couple of differences here. If we take the bass and move it over here, you will be able to hear that really quickly. Now, the first two are the same. Obviously, the rhythm is a little bit different, but the chords are the same. But then here, like the last four bars or whatever that is, three, six bars. There things differ quite a lot. Okay, so if we look at the notation for this, this is kind of the core of it all. This is kind of the pattern. It's a 16 bar pattern. This forms the chorus, this forms the intro, and a variation of this forms the verses, okay? So we have two bars of this little riff here, two bars that are sort of left empty um, by the, gu the guitars, including the bass guitar. Uh, then we repeat that, and then we have basically a six bar um, riff, and then two bars there at the end. a lot of transcription work <laughs> especially the drums took me a while to wrap my head around because there's quite a lot going on here education isn't anything until you do something with it you know uh, and you can be completely musical without having any education but it, it can give you a different perspective on things uh, like for example you know uh, the these odd rhythms we we sometimes work with uh, you wouldn't have to be educated to to get to that point. It's very the math is very simple, you know, uh, so, uh, and and everything about it is really simple. It's just a just a matter of you know perspective. The piano is the most simple uh, because that basically just repeats two patterns. Listen to that. I think that's quite cool. The chord does change from this bar to this bar here, but the piano stays the same. It's kind of cool because it like plays different parts of the of the overtone series. For the guitars here, what you'll notice is that the bass and the guitar play in sync. So you can see that the rhythms line up perfectly. So they're basically really just playing the same thing. And the bass always just plays the root notes of whatever the guitar is playing. So, so far, so good. That's that's all something that's not too complicated to uh, understand here. Here's it's almost the same thing, except that the bass goes to the 
to the low, uh, like goes an octave lower than the guitar basically. And I think that's ma mainly done because um, Tote probably really just like the slide here, like the da 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 da, you know, that thing. That's just really fun. And so um, that's probably why he did that. Uh, over here, still kind of the same thing. Although here he, uh, Tote slides up and the bassist slides down, which is kind of cool. Um, and then we have, this is pretty much the same thing. Again, like an octave lower over here. And then here at the end, again, an octave lower. So the bass just kind of stays in the same range down here and just goes up to the, the, the seven here to the B when he wants to do the slide down to the two here. And that's pretty much the only reason why you would ever want to go up on the bass uh, is to kind of get all those slides, right? Otherwise, it's always easier to play it in a simpler, uh, closer fingering lower down on the neck. And rhythmically, and this is really the kind of core, the backbone of, of this section, um, we have a lot going on. So we start with a quarter note, then we have a dotted dotted eighth note with a 16th note and then an eighth note rest and this pattern here this is the entire track essentially and this pattern here uh returns over here again we have an, uh, a dotted eighth note with the 16th note and then an eighth note rest it returns over here and it returns over here and it's this rhythmical pattern that makes this section so rhythmically interesting and challenging at the same time let's listen to that in isolation here that's really good fun. I, I really, really enjoy that. And uh, as, as we said, the bass drum here also follows exactly with this pattern, as you can see. Yeah. So uh, throughout the entire two bars, it does exactly what the uh, what the what the bass and the guitar are doing. Uh, and then we have a, a snare added on the three. And here we have a snare added in the three as well. So it's a kind of a halftime groove. Um, there's a couple of ghost notes and one that's a little bit louder, but technically is also kind of like a ghost note um, because this one is certainly not a backbeat. Uh, the, the, the ghost notes happen on the 16th note off beats. And then we have the right hand. And this is certainly the most complicated part for the drums, which kind of are all over the place. It's kind of difficult to find a, uh, let's call it a formula for the for the right hand. I think really the formula is that there is no formula. And that's exactly what makes the drums sound so challenging and interesting is that they're kind of all over the place and that we have stuff like um, omitting the right hand on the one of this beat over here, of this bar over here. Um, and it's kind of all over the place, you know. Um, there's not really a distinct pattern to it. And if you see uh, the drummer play this stuff live, You can tell, like he's he's playing it in a in a in a rushed way almost. Like if you look at his facial expressions, he's constantly just fighting the drum set. It feels like, and that's what it sounds like as well. And I think that's a really really cool thing. Um, it almost is like a, a sort of drum drunk groove. The rest of the, the so the bass and snare are very tightly locked together with the guitars and bass. But the right hand, what that's doing, or sometimes the left hand, whatever uh, he uses to to play the different symbols. Um, almost feels kind of drunk. It's like whenever he can get a note in, he just kind of goes for that, you know? And I think that's ultimately a lot of the magic of this track is just those drums. That's the musical side of things. And according to the band, this is something that the band creates first. Like before Arnur comes in with the vocals, this is what the band takes care of first. Still today, that's the way we've been working. Um, Told to finish like the entire instrumental soundscape just the uh, entire composition um uh, without without vocals that's how we, we've worked since since the beginning just he creates the entire composition i bring in the melodies and the lyrics and if we want to, to make some changes which we rarely do uh we do that at the end you know if it's you know something with the structure or something that could help carry the the the, the melody better changing maybe chords or Anything in the structure, we do that then. Now with this specific track, according to the band, um, they went back and forth a little bit more with the vocals to, to make sure that everything fits perfectly. The music is there pretty much from, from the start. The vocalist comes in, 
um, puts his vocals on top of it, and they don't go back, change chords, or change things around all that much, which is quite unusual because typically what we what we do is like we work back and forth. We change the melody a little bit, that changes the chords, that might change the melody again, and you kind of so to create this kind of interplay between the two elements. And this doesn't happen here, which I think is really really interesting, and it creates uh, a sort of creative limitation for Arnor, which is um, quite challenging, but also. Um, quite fun and I think uh, they managed beautifully to turn this into a great track. I love writing music that 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 you can hear in one more than one way. Sometimes you know you can hear it in three different ways. It's just a matter of you know perspective. So the next step now becomes adding in the vocals and we have a beautiful vocal line here. Um, first of all it's a melody line that spans all 16 bars. <laughs> There's certainly some some things that do repeat that are that are really really strong. It's especially this this little phrase over here, right? That is just really really beautiful. It's a B D and then a high B over here, um, meaning we have a, not really a triad, but we just have these huge jumps which are so 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 strong. Especially because the rest of the song is so rhythmically complex. Having a fairly simple rhythm like this. Um, is just really, really strong. The only kind of complicated moment here in the vocal melody is this little moment here with the dotted eighth notes. That's the only moment where we get sixteenth note, sixteenth notes at all. For the rest of it, it's fairly simple. It's it's very flowing, and that's something I think is really strong because the music, the instrumental, is so rhythmical. Now I wouldn't go as far as calling the melody simple. I think there's quite a lot, a little bit too much going on for that. Um, but it is a nice contrast in, in the rhythmical, if we're looking at the rhythm specifically, I think it's a really strong contrast. So the melody basically is a descending line. We move up to this really high note here, and then we move down from the B to an A, to a G, to an F, to a D, and then down to a B. So we have a little pickup phrase to a really high note, and then we slowly descend down that line which is always a really beautiful arc. Um, the descending arc is just, is, is really, really strong. We hear it in a lot of pop songs. It has a, a little bit of a darker vibe uh, compared to, um, you know, starting low and going up, 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 which has more of an uplifting vibe. Um, but we hear this one quite a lot and it's, I think it's really, really strong here. Then we kind of repeat that phrase over here. So again, we have this descending line. Then we have it for a third time, but this time, we have a little a little twist here, and this is something we also see quite a lot in in, in melody writing, is that we have uh, idea, repetition, and then change of that melody of that idea, like uh, development of it, and that's exactly what we have here. The third time we hear it, we still have this this little opener here with this little, beautiful little uh, arpeggio, but then we move into some higher notes, which come kind of as a surprise. Da, 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 yeah, yeah. So that is a really, really beautiful um, ending to a phrase. Is there any idea that you have why people are, why it's so easy to sing your melodies or remember them? Uh, my gut feeling is just, I mean, I, I, okay, this is a silly answer to it, but uh, for me to like what I'm doing, I need to be able to remember it because I'm not writing it down. I don't know how to write it down. So or I can record it, of course, but it's kind of a rule for me. If I can't remember the goddamn line, it's not good enough for me. Uh, you know, it, I, I have to, I have to love singing it. And I have to, it has to be like, you used the word catchy before. It's just, it has to catch me. Uh, you know, it has to be right behind the ear. And that's already the end of this melody. So we have three repetitions essentially or two repetitions and one development of the same melody, of the same idea. Uh, you can see melody one. So the first phrase starts here. The second phrase starts here. And the third phrase is all of this. The last phrase is twice the length of the first two phrases. 
just yesterday I had Kelly here, we were looking at one of the tracks and I was like, well, but can you like, here's the melody I have, but can you tell me now what what is actually going on? Like what is going on in this song? Because now I need to know, are there some chords I'm not hearing? Are you like a level 30 uh, kind of magician and I'm level two and I have no idea what's going on? And it's just so fascinating. So I come with this childish, uh, naive almost uh, approach to these songs and I purely focus on emotional content and to it just has to be natural like just figure out the melody fits naturally it gives me some kind of emotional pleasure and uh, something i can imagine like visually what i want to do lyrically with it uh and i i, th I think that's why i'm so much in love with uh, 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 with what we're doing <laughs> And that is the end of our video already, but not the end of this discussion. So if you would like to see the whole video I had with the band, you can go up here. We talk about a lot of different things, a lot of things that I didn't have time to talk about in this video here. We talk about an app that Arner uses to write his melodies. We talk about his process behind his lyrics. We talk about um, about their image and how they how, how they want to come across and what they what they think about when, when they make their music videos, for example. We talk about their new album. There is so much stuff in this interview. And if you're an Adrian Fresco fan, it's it's a must see. Uh, even if you're not a fan, if you don't know the band yet, it's definitely worth checking out because these guys are really, really good at what they're doing. And uh, it's always good to hear from other songwriters how they handle their process. Um, if you would like to send in questions for me to answer on a day on a weekly live stream or send in songs for me to give feedback to, you can do that over on Patreon. Check out the link in the description. And for everyone else who doesn't want to pay any money, you can also just download the welcome package from the website. Link is also in the description. Thank you so much for watching. Take care and stay gefährlich.